Hello there, uh, welcome back to this channel and today we're going to talk about the latest Harry Potter quiz show, Harry Potter and the Tournament of Houses. Uh, so Harry Potter and the Tournament of Houses is a quiz show uh, based around the world of Harry Potter, uh, made by Now TV. and before we get into the video, I just want to apologise to you all, there won't be a lot of footage from the show for this video, uh, because Now TV blocks the recording on the screen of their TV shows through um, their player online. Uh, so there won't be a lot of moving footage. Hopefully I'll be able to get some still still images, but that's why there's not a lot of footage in this video. And before we get into the video, uh, I just want to make note that the subtitles on the show are weird. I put the subtitles on while watching it uh, for fun. And if you ever watch Harry Potter and the Deathly Hallows part 1, I believe, remember the scene in the cafe with the wizards drawing and each time there's a spell cast it, uh, the subtitles describe the sound as ethereal dissonant hissing. Um, I found that funny, just wanted to mention that. Uh, and now on with the video. <laughs> So, as previously mentioned, the show is made by Now TV, a British streaming company. Uh, it aired on the 29th of December through their streaming service and on Sky, I believe. Um, it was probably made in anticipation of the 20th anniversary of the Harry Potter films. Um, and to not beat about the bush, uh, I didn't like it. I think it's uh, not, a good, not a good Harry Potter show, not a good uh, quiz show in general. It's funny. Um, but not not because it wants to be, but because of the way it fails. And overall, I think they could have done a much better job. Uh, so, if you haven't watched the show, uh, you're probably wondering how it works. It's a standard sort of uh, trivia show. So, in, if you're familiar with the four Harry Potter houses, Gryffindor, Ravenclaw, Slytherin, and the other one, the show opens with two of those houses in the stands, uh, those are two teams, and uh, as, as the show opens, uh, everybody cheers, that, that will become a theme. The audience are extremely happy, they'll cheer at anything and everything, um, they'll cheer after the app breaks, um, they'll cheer when the questions come up, and I'll tell you that they've even cheered when their, their own team has got a question wrong, uh, which I find hilarious. Uh, so once we spend the far too long uh, zooming in on the random faces in the audience, uh, we cut to the central stage, uh, and Helen Mirren presents this show. Uh, she's a British actress. And on watching it, uh, I naturally assumed she was in Harry Potter. You know, I haven't seen the films for several years. And I, I looked this up, and it, she has no role in Harry Potter. So I can only assume that the producers wanted somebody British to present it, and she was the only person they could get. Because as far as I can tell, she uh, has no relation at all to Harry Potter. So I don't know why she presents the show, but she does. Uh, she does an okay job of presenting it. Could have been far, far, far worse. Um, if she tells a few jokes, they aren't good. Not her fault. I'm sure she was told to say them. That's what I've really got to say on the presenter. Although there's like maybe 50 people per house in the stands, only three from each house sort of really play in the show. And they're selected uh, randomly, um, entirely randomly by a shower of letters reminiscent of the shower of letters in the first Harry Potter film, you know, through the chimney of the Dursley's house, and we get our three entirely random contestants. Uh, the first thing I wanted to talk about in regards to the show is how hard and how you know, immediately it tries to distance itself from J.K. Rowling, uh, I'd say rightly so. So, uh, once the contestants are selected in the first show, uh, they will come up onto the stage a few of them, they get their introductions and learn a bit about them. Um, and one of them, one of the contestants says, in regards to a social media sort of channel he runs about diversity in Harry Potter, which so we just kind of want to make a safe space for diversity. I can look like and be a character. Um, and then the host uh, responds, and you know, it's a manifestation of how incredibly universal the Harry Potter stories are. I just find this funny how utterly and totally someone can destroy their credibility and their relation to something they themselves created um, by saying uh, such hateful things. Uh, so I just wanted to point that out. Um, and moving on to the actual questions themselves. 
The first round uh, essentially has the the contestants watch a scene and then answer to unconnected questions. So the first question in uh, this area is they watch like a 30 second clip from one of the Harry Potter films and then answer a question on it. This is a very weird question. Well, after this, the three contestants will spend like half a minute debating it, uh, which is hilarious because they uh, literally just saw the answer. Uh, these questions are all relatively easy, but have nothing really to do with your knowledge of Harry Potter trivia. If you drop somebody who'd only seen the films once, or even not at all, there's like a fair chance they could still get these questions right. For example, uh, you know the infamous scene in The Goblet of Fire, when Dumbledore does not speak to Harry calmly? The question is, what does Madame Maxine swat away with her hand as she enters the room and the answer is a sort of light fixture type thing. They're, they're questions like that. Uh, they're very easy and they've really got nothing to do with the films. The second and third questions in the first round are basically the same, uh, except in the third question, uh, the houses can vote with the opportunity to get extra points if the majority votes for the correct answer. Both these questions are multiple choice and again uh, they're very easy. Well it shouldn't be so bad, you know it's the first round, um, but the show writers seem to have an intense desire to add one incredibly stupid potential answer into the mix. So just some examples, uh, what was Lupin's nickname on the Marauder's map? And the possible answers were Padfoot, Mooney, Bongs, all good so far because they have actual nicknames, and the Lupinator. And another one, what was Godric Gryffindor's birthplace? Gideon's Glen, Godric's Hollow, Gregson's Corner, or Sesame Street. And especially with that second one, it becomes so obvious what the correct answer is. There's almost no point asking the question, let alone once you factor in that everybody on the show loves Harry Potter, has watched the films and read the books multiple times, and had very little chance of getting these wrong. Uh, the other thing about the third question is that it's presented to the teams by an actor from the Harry Potter films. And let me read you the list of actors they have on the show. Uh, Simon Fisher Barber, Tom Felton, Matthew Lewis and Shirley Henderson. So they, they're, they're all actors who are in the show, which is a step up from Helen Mirren, and that's a, a bonus. But especially with Simon Fisher Barber, I I had to look up who he played. He plays the Hufflepuff house ghost, who I'm fairly certain is only in the first film. Has no lines, only appears for a single shot. Now of course some of the others, like Tom Felton and Matthew Lewis, they're major roles. They could only get two very minor roles and two supporting roles to show up and answer the questions. Bear in mind this isn't even on the actual show. Uh, it's all pre-recorded. It mainly just comes off as cheap, really. They don't particularly add anything to the show, other than getting the audience hysterically excited. And there's nothing too unique in the way they deliver the questions. Um, it might be more exciting if the questions were themed to the character they played, or were slightly harder. But we'll circle round to why the showrunners didn't do that uh, in a bit. In the next round, they change it up slightly, to make it a bit more interesting. So there's three questions, and the opposing team chooses who on their opposite team uh, who will answer the question, uh, which is a bit more unique. I've never seen it done before on a quiz show. And the questions get a little bit better here. For example, what is Dumbledore's third name out of Albus, Wolfric, Brighton, and Percival? Uh, which is a far better question because they're all names he does have, and it's not. It's not necessarily something you'd know on a casual viewing or reading. There are still some stupid questions, but it, it gets better here. Uh, the houses vote again. And one thing I will say is the teams in this game, I can only assume they were told to you by um, the producers. They really talk about stuff, like all, every single decision. They confer on even the most basic questions. It feels so sort of strange and artificial sometimes. It doesn't feel natural. It comes across so some of these is just the edge of the camera holding up a sign, telling them exactly what to say and how to act. The next round, I think we're on the third round now, not sure, uh, is the best round. Essentially they have 
a wall of icons with different spells from Harry Potter, and you've got to choose a one of those spells, and that gives you a type of question. And just to give you an example, the different spells will have different types of questions. Just to give you an example, uh, you know the scene in The Half Blood Prince when Dumbledore fights the um, water zombies and uh, incinerates them. Yeah, so the music and audio from that scene is played, and the contestants then have to guess what scene that's from. Or... A very zoomed up image of the Prawn and Ministry of Magic shown. And... The contestants have to guess what that zoomed in image is showing. And these questions are just really fun. Uh, they're a lot harder than the exact opposite of what the round one questions were. They really were stuff you had to be a die-hard Harry Potter fan to get, which is probably why I didn't get any of them. And this is probably the best round in the show. All of the other problems with it, um, such as the constant ad breaks, the audience cheering far too much at everything, and the constant discussion over questions, that's all still there, but at least the questions aren't terrible. So for the next part, a celebrity fan reads a passage from Harry Potter and they stop and the teams have to guess the next word. Could they just not get a cast member? Even get a cast member from a different part of the show to use that? I don't know why they get a celebrity fan in. The celebrity fans aren't really celebrities and quite major ones. It feels so random to get a celebrity fan in rather than an actor who's on the show. I mean, they, they, then again, they hired an actor who wasn't in Harry Potter to present the show. At least they're consistent. Uh, I guess this section's fine. The only other notable thing about it is the lighting. The pre-recorded segments where they read the passage is really washed out and yellow, and it, it makes everybody who's put under it look slightly ill. I thought that was weird. I don't know anybody didn't notice that in post-production. And uh, talking about the sort of post-production, uh, the production values are really high on this show. It looks good. Uh, apart from in that one section, the lighting's good, sounds good, the colours are vibrant. I expect it to look good. I'd be surprised if it wasn't when you're working with that sort of money. But uh, after that um, little break of positivity there, uh, we get to the last round. And the last round is even worse than the first round. So the houses vote, and it's made clear that if your house gets all of the questions right, through majority, um, that, then your points are doubled in that round. And this is the one round where we don't find out what the house has got at the question. It's all announced at the end. We'll get on to the announcement in a minute. And maybe this idea would have some tension, but the questions are stupidly easy, which means as you watch the first, well, first three, and you know the pattern by the fourth episode, you realise that because these questions are often so easy, unless one of the houses messes up and doesn't get the double bonus, very often times, the team that has the advantage going into this round wins. In the first episode, out of the six questions in this round, five times both teams went for the same answer, and five times they both got it right. And there was one time, which I think was the fifth question, where they went for different answers, one team still got that question right. That just shows that the questions are too easy when, in a round of six questions, five times both teams got it right. Yeah, we'll get to the easiness of questions in a minute. In the first episode, Hufflepuff wins the show, and they are on to the final. Which brings us on to how the show is structured. So, there's four episodes in the first season. God himself hopes they don't renew it for the second. The first two feature Gryffindor vs Hufflepuff, and then Ravenclaw vs Slytherin. And the winners of those two episodes go immediately into the final. third episode is then Griff Gryffindor and Slytherin, who won their matchups, going against each other 
to decide which one of them will have a place in the final, which is a really weird way of structuring a show. I've never seen anything like that before. Because going into it, I assumed it was going to be a five episode series and be around Robin. You know, if you don't know what around Robin is, where everybody plays against everybody else. And so they had this sort of slightly strange three team final. I've never seen it done before, which is something. But yeah, the format's slightly strange. Probably could have been condensed slightly. As I mentioned earlier, in the last round, we don't find out how the houses are voted right away. Uh, we get it announced to us uh, by Luke Youngblood. You may know him more familiarly as Lee Jordan, the character from Harry Potter who he played. Um, which is good. It's a step up from people in the show who have no connection to it whatsoever. So now seeing how the house is voted is the only useful thing he really does in the show. He appears multiple times previously, I didn't think to mention it though, because essentially he tells us the current scores which we can already see. There's no real problem with this, this section lasts about 30 seconds, but I just don't understand why they have somebody to announce the scores that we can see ourselves. It's really not a big thing, but it annoyed me. Um, so he, he's in the show, and he had no need to be. So just to recap on the problems we've had, I, well, I have had with the show so far. There's too many ad breaks, something's just off with some of the guest stars, the questions are far too easy, the format's slightly strange, and it also mentions the cursed child, which upsets me deeply. Especially as this was marketed as Harry Potter and the Tournament of Houses. Despite this, um, material from The Cursed Child and also the Fantastic Beasts films is mentioned, and as a stickler for the technicalities, you know, it made me upset. I don't think it bothered anybody else whatsoever. My main problem with the show can sort of be summed up in one word. It's a word that isn't an official word, I don't think. It might have been used before, but if it's not, I'm, I'm claiming it for my own, and that word would be Americanization. <laughs> So we got anything to do with America. It's the idea of being dialed up to 11. And basically, if you ever watched a British show and then watched an American version of it, or a British version of an American show, just there seems to be a divide. Usually in the production policy, um, American shows often look a lot better. But everything just seems to be that the dialed up to absolute level, you know, the audience is excited, um, like, the, the music is more suspenseful, uh, the prizes are always bigger, usually, um, unless, unless you're on a budget, and the Harry Potter, which is something so quintessentially British, I mean, famously, the cast of the films is entirely British, it felt weird it to be set in America, with mostly Americans on it, and it's not a worse style of TV, it's a different style of TV, but someone who grew up watching British TV, it's a very weird experience than watching American programme. It is a lot more exciting to watch, despite hating the show, I definitely got into it, and it, it gets you excited. As Bruce mentioned, I also hated the show, so there, there's that trade-off. Like, American TV isn't worse, it's different, but I, I prefer British TV. So there, there's that. No, that's not even an issue. I like lots of American shows. The real problem with this is the approach to writing the questions. Because I was just so confused because the questions were so easy to answer and they really just didn't feel like ultimate Harry Potter knowledge that only the diehard fans would know. So I went out in search of an article or just something to explain their approach and I found an article interviewing Yasmin Shackleton, who produced the show, and I found this quote. More than half the questions were purposely made multiple choice, so viewers could more easily play at home as well. Of course, everything the quack and uh, this is a correct, direct quote now, of everything the questions were the trickiest balance to get right, Shackleton, the executive producer, said, but I think we got it. 
and there's the more than half the person that perfectly made my choice part. I think it just shows the attitude to try and make this a mass appeal show. Whereas when you're making a die-hard trivia show, I think to some extent you're going to have to accept that it's just not going to get the viewership that a standard quiz show would have. And I feel the approach here should have been how can we make this the best experience for Harry Potter fans rather than how can we market this to as many people as possible. If I sign up for a war film on say, um, say any event in World War II and then a romance is shoved into the film for no reason whatsoever, it just it dilutes the experience. And at the end of the day, in the capitalist safe we find ourselves living in, that works out best because, I mean, more people watching it, more money you make off it. But I think they, this was the wrong approach. They should, have just, they should have just gone straight into the most difficult questions they could on Harry Potter to really make it a true Harry Potter trivia show experience. And instead of trying to make it mass appeal, just direct it at Harry Potter fans, I wouldn't describe any of the companies involved in the making of the show as being under financial pressure and having to make sure every show is a success. I think the ethos behind the show was wrong. They set, they set out to make the show on the wrong foundations, and I think, in a way, it was doomed from the start. Uh, thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.